All right, sorry for the delay. Um, we also had a last minute switch up, so um, this talk was scheduled for tomorrow. We're doing it today because one of the speakers became ill, so we had to shuffle some things around. Um, so if you're here for the Grails and Google Cloud talk, you're in the right place. <laughs> I apologize for uh, the switching around. All right, my name is Ryan Vandewerf. I'm a software engineer in the Grails Micronaut team at Object Computing. And I'm a dad of a couple of kids, and I love to tinker with cloud stuff and gadgets and cars and beer and wine or whatever. So if you don't like this talk, maybe we can talk about making beer or wine or tinkering with cars uh, after this. Uh, if you need any kind of like uh, help with Groovy Grails or Micronaut support, uh, we're here to help. So just grab any one of us at our little booth out there. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? I've got a lot of stuff here. Uh, the point of this talk is to give you a kind of an overview of using Google Cloud. Uh, how many of you use Google Cloud already? So we've got, we got a couple, right? Um, this is basically going to give you the kind of introduction of how a lot of basic services work and how uh, to, to deploy to them in uh, using the APIs uh, in your Grails code. So uh, I'm going to show you the uh, Google Cloud console. We're going to talk about the Google Cloud SDK. We talk about um, the compute and app engine, and uh, we're going to, you know, show you how you push a Grails application to app engine. I'm not going to do that during our talk because it takes like 20 minutes, <laughs> so you don't want to watch that happen. We we'll talk about the um, Cloud SQL, setting up a database um, like a MySQL database. Uh, how to use the APIs for cloud storage, so that means putting things into buckets. Uh, how to upload and download those in your Grails app. I'm going to talk about how Bigtable works, which is going to be sort of a Hadoop quick intro. And uh, I've got a, some Grails examples of how to use that. Um, there's some trickiness involving these SDKs that you have to uh, deal with um, because of class conflicts and things like that. I'm going to show you how PubSub works. I'm going to show you that in the Grails app, how we um, publish a message and then subscribe to messages and then receive those and process them. So that's that's, in a nutshell, what we're going to cover. So we've got a lot of stuff, so I'm going to get going here. Um, so free stuff. There's a free tier. Uh, this is something that's um, relatively new, uh, where you can get a free tier like Amazon has for a year. Um, and that's basically a competition. But what's cool about it also is uh, you don't have to look around very hard. It's pretty easy to get started, and you'll get a $300 credit when you just sign up for an account. So uh, what's cool is you don't need to give them a credit card number when you first sign up. So once that uh, free tier is exhausted and your $300 credit's exhausted, then it's going to tell you you need to sign up and for real and put a, uh, you know, payment information in. So you can do a lot with uh, just this free tier here to get started um, doing things in the Google Cloud. Uh, you can, the free stuff, uh, the free tier is, um, uh, I don't think that even necessarily ends. But you can always do at least an F1 micro type of instance with um, three gigs of storage. Uh, so you can basically run one of those per month for nothing. So I like free stuff. So uh, you get 28 uh, instance hours a day in App Engine. I don't know why it's 28, because there's 24 hours in a day. But you could run another one for a couple hours. <laughs> uh, you get five uh, gigs of cloud storage, free memcache. Uh, you get thousand search ops a day, you can send emails, like a hundred of those. The PubSub messages, processing 10 gigabytes a month is pretty generous. So you could just have a PubSub app running in there for nothing. So it's pretty cool. I got a link there, you can check out what else you get for free. That's the, the high level stuff. Here's, uh, this is about a year old, but this is kind of where the competition sits with Google and Amazon and, and Microsoft. So uh, I think Google is a little bit higher, probably around there right now. They're still kind of in third place, so they're trying to differentiate themselves uh, a lot in machine learning and things like that um, compared to Amazon because um, they're just a little bit behind in that respect. But why would you use Google Cloud? I mean, there's definitely a lot of stuff. There's free stuff, but sometimes uh, maybe your business is a competitor to Amazon or Microsoft, so uh, that might be your best choice. I know a lot of data scientists have a lot of experience with Google Cloud, so sometimes they prefer that. But uh, you as a developer may just be asked, like, hey, what would it take to move our Grails application to Google Cloud? What would be all involved? So I'm trying, trying to try to help you out with that. Um, 
or you may already be using it, like a couple of people of you um, in here are already using. So anyway, that's uh, useful to know. All right, so how do we get to the uh, Google Cloud Console? So um, it's associated with your Google Gmail account, basically. And we can go in and, um, and this, this is what you'll see when you go to the home page of your project. I have a little mini project here, and I've spun up some stuff. Um, if you're running uh, Grails applications, what you're going to need to do is we're using um, uh, App Engine Flexible. That's, what, that's what's required to be able to use Grails on um, uh, App Engine for Google Cloud. So uh, you have to install an SDK in your system. Um, I recommend that you do this. I mean, if you're going to be working with Google Cloud, you really need to have this stuff installed. So you're going to have the G Cloud CLI uh, for deploying and creating resources and checking the status of some things. So all you need to do is download this SDK, run G Cloud in it, enter your account information, and it'll be your Gmail account that you want to associate um, your Google Cloud account with. So just pick whichever one you want to do that on. Obviously, you could probably do a free trial for, if you, if you have multiple Gmail accounts, you could do a free trial for each one. All right, and then at that point, we can do App Engine. So here's the, how App Engine kind of works. It's, uh, you know, they have a, a load balancer here, and so when you deploy versions and things like that, uh, you can specify like a load split across multiple instances or even versions like A-B testing. And then we're going to the App Engine here, uh, which can auto-scale number of instances. And then from that, we're talking um, to their cloud storage or cloud SQL, cloud data store, uh, queues, things like that. Um, and then Memcache can sit up here um, to share state across those nodes. Uh, you, so you can create a new application. Uh, you can just say gclub app create, and it'll create a new application. Uh, pick the region and zone you want, and then we can say app deploy, uh, and you can do that. But we're not going to be using app deploy for Grails. We've got a nice Gradle plugin that does all of this work for us. So uh, all we have to do to set up our Grails app to deploy is we use the um, plugin for Gradle, and it'll, it'll basically give us these options here. Yeah, we're using this App Engine plugin right here. Uh, this is the magic sauce right here that will let us deploy. So when we do that, suddenly in our, our Gradle tasks, we'll have uh, an option here. We'll have an App Engine flexible environment task added. Uh, a group of tasks, actually. And all we need to do to deploy each time we want was we just click on this thing here, App Engine Deploy. Uh, it's going to build up, package up our application, and push it out to App Engine. And so uh, you're going to use this instead of the CLI tool for deploying it. And it does take a while. It takes, for whatever reason, it takes me like 20 minutes. I'm not sure uh, why. But. All right. And of course, you can use start.grails.org still, or SDK man, you know, create an application, add that magic sauce. I'll share these slides with you, and you'll have a link to the source demos where you can grab all these uh, scripts that you would add in. All right, so once we set up that App Engine plugin, which I showed you here, All we need to do is add this in, and that's all you really have to do. Uh, so I recommend when you do the, your um, configuration, you basically say um, gcloud init, and then set your default credentials that way, and then it'll automatically pick them up for 
uh, your system. It'll ask you to log in your Gmail and create a token and save it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Cloud SQL. So once you've got your compute engines and all that, we want Cloud SQL created so we can spin up a database, and it does this really quickly. Uh, it's one of the really nice things I love about it. You can basically spin up a Postgres or MySQL database on, on Google Cloud, and uh, as far as their database as a service goes, those are your choices. I'll show you that here. So all we need to do is go down to SQL. <laughs> Under storage. I'm actually using this one right here. And we can p specify the region. Right now it's running in the US East, but we can they have a lot of regions all over the place, which is pretty cool. Um, but here we'll make a new one just for grins. Pick MySQL or Postgres. Give it a name. Actually, let's just generate a random one. Uh, we can use this. That's it. That's all you need to do. You can pick the database version. Uh, d you don't want to run anything past uh, in the 8 range uh, because the version of Hibernate that's needed that Grails uses is uh, too old. So uh, don't spin up a uh, MySQL 8 plus version instance because Grails won't talk to it. Or actually, Gorm can't talk to it because there's. GORM hasn't been updated to the newest enough Hibernate for that to work. Uh, it spins for a little bit, and then we're ready to go. Hmm? I think it, uh, that, it, um, I was not able to get it to work with GORM 7 when I tried it last. And that was actually on Amazon, but same, same problem. Um, basically gets a bunch of syntax errors when it tries to boot up. All right, uh, to do Cloud SQL though, this is what gets a lot of people, is you have to actually go in. So every time you wanna access a Google service, you need to enable the API. So you have to actually go, um, uh, to the API screen. And turn them on. So you actually have to go find the Cloud SQL um, here under Enable APIs and Services. So if you don't, most of these are not turned on by default. So you have to go find SQL and go in here and then enable it. And then enable the administration for it. And if you want to do PubSub or any of those other things, you have to go in here and enable the API uh, because you could grab this code, download my Git repo, fire up the application, and then access denied, access denied. What is going on? Uh, giving it good credentials, it's because the APIs are not enabled. So uh, always remember to do that first before you start actually doing Grail stuff. All right. And also in our application, we add the MySQL jars. Uh, after we've created our instance, it uses this... Um, Funky format, I'll show you. It's not using TCP IP by default. We can go into the... So it's got this strange connection string, and I would definitely um, get this from one of the example apps, either from the guide or from this example app that I have here, because uh, it tells you socket factory equals, and it's got this special class name. So you have to have a special G Google Cloud SQL driver 
added to your project as well for this to work. Um, or it basically will automatically negotiate like an SSL certificate and be able to talk to the database and handle all those things for you. And then you got to use a special format here where it's like my, uh, this is my uh, project name and then the region and then the zone and then the name of my database. And that's how we connect to it. And it uses SSL automatically. I don't care if you see my password. I'm going <laughs> to shut down those instances when we're done here. All right. And so we get, we've got a, a demo application here. Do it this way. So I've already pre-deployed this uh, right five minutes before this talk. And so this is from the Grails guide. We've got a list of books. These are all being stored and retrieved on the Cloud SQL database. And uh, in this thing here, I can create some default books. I can um, uh, edit the book and change something about it. We want to update this to Grails 4. So now we're updated. We can upload uh, something, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is Google using Google Storage. So this demo application has a way to upload an image. Say edit fe featured image. I have to pick a small picture. I didn't configure the limits. Let's find something good. This is probably small enough. The old Zoolander gas station. There we go. That's what happens when supermodels pump gas, I guess. Um, so let's take a look at the code for that. All right, let's start forward from the controller. And again, this, this particular example is, is straight from the guide, so um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But we basically have a service for books, pretty standard boilerplate stuff. So really, there isn't a lot of special things once you've got the drivers installed and the configuration set up. Um, let's go into services. That's where all the actual stuff is. And what's really confusing is Google has about four APIs for Java that all do the same thing. And they all have various little quirks about them. Um, this particular one that we're using here works uh, best for um, Grails. Some of them have class library conflicts with things that Grails is used internally and all that. But you see this is regular GORM. You don't have to do anything special. The cloud storage stuff, on the other hand, here's where we get into special Google stuff, right? So when we uploaded that feature image, it actually put it in a bucket here. So I can go find it under um, storage. Just, yeah, it's just regular old storage. This is just like uh, S3 buckets on the Amazon. So here's my picture that I uploaded. It, to prove you, I've, there's no magic behind my hands. It's, it's really there. Not faking it. Go on. Uh, let's talk about cloud storage now, since I just showed you that. Uh, Google Cloud Storage is just a network object store like Amazon S3. Uh, make sure you enable the cloud storage API for your application to be able to use this. And then you can create a bucket. And then inside of there, uh, in Grails, you just need to configure what bucket you're using and, uh, in your project, and then add the jars to the build.gradle, and then you're good to go. Um, let me show you the configuration for that. Right, so uh, we have a Google Cloud uh, heading, and then below that we've got Cloud Storage, and then Bucket, and then that's where we're putting, that's how we tell it where to put our files. Uh, you can also tell the Google Cloud plugin support that what the project name is, 
Um, in this case, I also added something for big table. We'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, here's our, let me jump uh, now into App Engine. And so this is all we have to do deploy, Gradle W App Engine deploy. Uh, you can enable logging. So this is how you see what's going on. So we'll go down to um, App Engine and go to versions. This is the easiest way I find to. Um, I've actually rolled back to an older one because I had some issues. And I can view my logs and it's got all of my log output from Grails all ends up here. So you can see I've got my logging cranked way up just to show you everything that happens and that's going on here. So uh, if your application doesn't start or you're getting a weird error, um, look here and then you'll find out why. Um, in my case, I had some database connectivity issues. And what will happen is the application will never start successfully when you deploy it. It'll act like it's OK. But then you go to the page and you get you know, a bunch of errors. Um, this is where you need to go to troubleshoot what's going on. So. All right. Now let's talk about Bigtable. Bigtable is the HBase cluster uh, running on Google Cloud. And this is a really, um, how many people here use Hadoop or have, you have used Hadoop? Is anyone? It's, it's, it's a big hammer for processing lots of data. Um, so basically a wide column store. Uh, it's meant to do MapReduce operations, but you have transactions on it, so they've added their own kind of sugar on top of it. And this is really what um, the storage mechanism for, for HBase uh, service on Bigtable powers all these Google services that they use. So they eat their own dog food, right? This is using uh, analytics, maps, Gmail, all these things are using this underlying storage uh, system that this uses. So it, you, you know it will scale and use that. And they were nice enough, even though they made a special version of this, you can still use the Apache HBase Java library to use it. All right, so what is Bigtable? And again, Bigtable's uh, basically a sparsely populated um, table that can scale to billions of rows and thousands of columns. And you can store all kinds of terabytes of data, right? You can just stream binary stuff in and just pour stuff in there constantly. Um, if you need to just dump a fire hose of stuff somewhere and then maybe analyze it later, uh, this is what you want to do. So it's, uh, it's basically just key value pairs that are stored. Uh, but the data you get back is always going to be a, a bunch of bytes. So you're going to need to convert that into whatever you need to use. Bigtable is really good. Um, you know. It's just a good storage engine for these MapReduce operations, any kind of stream or processing of analytics or machine learning applications uh, where it needs to learn from tons of data. Uh, that's what you want to use this for. And the, let me talk about the storage architecture. <coughs> so it, it stores things in massively scalable tables. Um, a table is composed of rows. Uh, each row describes a single entity. But columns can have individual values. And each row is indexed um, by a single key, and columns that are related to one another are grouped together in something called a column family. And each column is identified by a combination of column family and column qualifier. Uh, and that's always unique within a column family. So it gets pretty complicated. So here's an example of what it kind of looks like when you're storing this data. We've got um, over here, I've got a row key of uh, some presidents, and then <coughs> we can say, oh, this person follows these other people. And so I could store a bit of data in there for each one of those. So each table uh, contains one column family and follows the family. Family contains multiple column qualifiers. Um, and col column qualifiers are used as the data. So that's, um, that's these numbers over here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the username is used as a row key. Uh, usernames being those presidents' names. They're basically evenly spread across the alphabet uh, so that data access is, you know, when it's random, can be uh, uniform. And here's kind of the architecture of how all of this works. So I mean, if you spin up an instance of Bigtable, and it's pretty expensive, uh, the cheapest instance you can run on this is 
probably going to push $100 a month. So you definitely want to shut this off when you're not using it or delete it. It's creating all of these servers uh, to store all of these tables each time you spin up big table. So you've, it's going to spin up a minimum of three nodes, and then it's going to create all these small tables inside of it, and then it has these uh, shared log. And Colossus is the underlying storage mechanism that Google invented to store all of this massive amounts of data for their own services like Gmail and, uh, and stuff like that. So I'll uh, teach you a little bit about the vocabulary here. So nodes are called tablet servers. So if you're talking to Hadoop people, you're going to ask about tablet servers. Um, and they're just shared into blocks of contiguous rows called tablets. And that helps balance the load of queries across a group of servers. And all of this is happening behind the scenes. So it doesn't even look like any of these are happening. But it helps to understand what this is, because it gets really confusing when I show you the code and when you try to like get data in and out of this. And that they're stored in this thing called SS table in Colossus, which is Google's basically giant file system that backs everything. And you get basically an Im immutable map of keys and values, um, and they're stored as arbitrary byte strings, right? So everything you pull out of uh, big table is going to be an array of bytes. So it's up to you to figure out what to do with those bytes. If you, if you need some knowledge of how they got there and what they were. All right, so um, <laughs> getting this to work is uh, a little bit tricky uh, with Grails because um, Google has this, in their ultimate wisdom, I guess, they decide to package up open source libraries and shadow them in their own jars. So basically what will happen is you'll get a Google, Google HBase uh, cloud library of some sort to support some Google functions, and what will happen is it'll have some open source packages in it, hiding. So what happens is you get class library conflicts like crazy. Um, for example, I have the group of demos. I actually have two Grails applications. You can't even use both of them simultaneously in one application without tons of conflicts. And it gets better. <laughs> Let me show you that. So you have to have these versions in synchro synchronizing with the versions to the right of it. If you don't, you'll get really strange errors trying to boot Grails up and talk to any sort of Google service. You have to have all of these things in sync, and that means checking your Gradle dependency tree and, and verifying that uh, the gRPC Netty version that's in the dependency tree matches the Netty handler version, and it has that TC native SSL version. And it's because it's using a client uh, that's wrapping Netty. <laughs> Uh, for SSL to talk, right? It's using SSL to talk to Google services uh, remotely. So if you're, whatever version you're running, you need to have this map. This is a lot of blood, sweat, and tears finding this map and putting it together so you don't have to. <laughs> so, yeah, and if it's not right, what will happen is you'll get strange, like, uh, abstract class not found type of errors. Um, trying to connect to Google services and do things. So um, make sure you have this taken care of. All right, so let's take a look at some Grails big table stuff. Um, so all we need to do to access Bigtable, uh, we can inject an uh, app engine instance right here. We just have to declare it, and because Grails has magic, it will automatically put that bean there for you. And let's take a look at app engine service and see what's in there. So here we've got to keep a connection open to uh, Bigtable. We've got some code to c do some boilerplate connections types of stuff. Um, set credentials, uh, be able to read credentials, 
set those, some boilerplate here. Uh, so here's the, gonna be the table name that we're gonna make, um, column family name and column name. So you need to know all of this data in order to store something, and you're gonna need that data to retrieve it too. So once we initialize all of our connection, here's how we do this. We create uh, a table first. So uh, we do this when we start, basically. And this is called H table descriptor. We add a family to it, and then we can call uh, create on a table. And then when we want to get some data here, we're going to pull all of the value out of a table. So we just say, uh, once our connection is established, it's called get table. We get a table object. We can iterate over that um, using row keys. Uh, at this point, at this, uh, we're actually iterating and populating some data, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, this is how we add data to it, though. We need family name, column name, and then we store that as bytes, right? So all of the data going in, we're just dumping byte data in. So if you got a string, you got to convert it to a byte array, and then that's what's stored. And we put save in the table. Uh, and then we need to be able to get a row. We need to know what the row key was that we were looking for. And now we can say get... Uh, do a new get request on the table, we get a result, we get a bunch of bytes back, and then we can say bytes to string, because we know this one was a string, and now we've got our data back, and then we can get a row of data. Uh, we can also scan to search for things here, it's called table scanner, and so then uh, in the scan you can, I'm grabbing all rows, but you can specify um, more data to narrow it down so it doesn't grab so much data, and, and um, grab that, process it, do something with it. And again, this is you know how you get an item. You create a scan object, create a get object. Um, actually, in this case, we don't need a scan. We can just say get if you know the column key. If you don't know the column, the row key, then we need to um, do a scan operation and then find it. Um, if if you've ever used uh, DynamoDB and Amazon, uh, some of the querying is kind of similar-ish. All right, let's switch gears. Um, it's a little bit of a, a snooze fest with Bigtable, because it's complicated. Uh, doing simple things with PubSub, because you can do a lot with this. You get 10 gigabytes of PubSub messages a month for free. So um, you can do either a push or a pull model. And this is how the architecture works. So you can basically send messages and subscribe to messages uh, from any of these services. So any of these things, event could happen, send a message, uh, you can consume them you know, by any of these other things. So um, it's a pretty uh, versatile uh, way to talk to things. And we've got publisher A, B, C, here's how the flow works. Um, get a message, we create a topic, you can subscribe to a topic, and then you can start receiving messages. And so here, I'll show you how to set up the topics in the console. I've got some set up. So, there we go. so you can create a topic, and that's what you're going to be publishing messages to. And then here, I created a subscriber via the uh, Grails application demo here. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. And we're going to be pulling. So basically pull and then look for messages on the, on the system. Yeah, I don't know my shell going. So here I'll send a message to that same queue. And so we say message sent. So let's try to check for messages. Let's take a look. I've printed out on the console here. So, yep. So I sent this message, and then I received this message. And I just have a string in here called message zero. Nothing really exciting. And you don't even have to be have your application running on Google Cloud to be able to use the PubSub stuff. I'm running this application locally. I'm talking with my credentials from my G Cloud uh, setup. 
and I can still be subscribing to topics and getting information and data running. So it's not uh, necessarily a requirement to do that. And so let's see how we do that. Let's look at the code. Let's make the font so big so everyone can see. Interesting bits are in the services. All right, so first we have to create a topic. So we have a topic service. We have to declare a bunch of things, variables and things, but um, the gut is we create, uh, find the project ID, connect to that, create a topic, um, format as a topic kind of creation request, and then uh, that's all we have to do to create it. And then uh, we can publish things to it. Here's our publisher demo. So again, we find the topic, look up the topic, and now we can send a message to it. We just say, uh, create a new pub sub message is the uh, object. And then we can set the data for it, build it, and then we can send it here, say publish, do publish. And um, this would actually work quite well with Micronaut because of all the um, uh, async operations you can do. I have this blocking for the demo, so. But once you publish it, then you can even call back in the future and tell you if it was successful or not. Uh, or you can add a callback function, and then it'll execute that code. And so I've created a callback in this case where uh, if it fails, it's going ahead and print out a message saying error publishing message um, whenever that finishes and gets around to it. or um, print the message out that we sent it, the message ID. And that's where we see right here, this message ID. So publish that, print it out. And then when we want to get the information, subscribe to the topic. Uh, you can't really create a subscriber, I don't think, from here. You used to not be able to. Um, you can now, actually, so that's cool. Uh, you used to be able to only do this through the API. And I guess they finally realized that was that's silly. All right. So basically, you're going to run some kind of polling thread. P pull, look for messages, process them, uh, do whatever you want for it. So again, we've got messages. We've got topics. Topic is what the uh, message is going to be about. Uh, the message is actually the message itself. The publisher is the person who sends the message, and the subscriber is the one who wants to receive the message. Okay, we did all that. All right, so in the end, we want to uh, make sure we clean up and shut down everything. All this stuff costs money, especially uh, big table. So remember, you've got 28 instance hours for free until it eats into your $300 credit. So make sure you uh, either delete your project or go into the project and disable uh, your application. So this not obvious how to do this. So you actually have to go down here to settings. Because uh, here, if I want to go here, right, and I say, oh, I've got my uh, app engine running, how do I stop it? Well, you know, I, I can't. I can stop an instance, and <laughs> what will happen is it'll just spin another one up. So um, if you have more than one service here, you, you can turn those off. But the default ones, see, there's no, I can't, turn, I can't stop it. I can't get rid of it. What do I do? It's going to start costing me money. You have to go down into settings here and say disable application, and then that will turn off the default instance. Uh, if you forget, it's just things going to be running all day, so hopefully you didn't spin up a big one or you're, you're going to break your, blow your free $300 credit, which we don't want to do. Yeah, so what you could do is go to disable application here, and then uh, when you come back the next day, you can re-enable it. And that, so I've actually had this project sort of in suspension where it hasn't been billing any money uh, to, to OCI because 
uh, everything has been disabled, including the default application, for about three or four months, and then I come back today and turn it all back on. Um, now, you can't really do that with the SQL instances. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, so SQL here, um, you can't really stop them, I guess. Let's see. Yeah, you, you, you can back up the database and keep your data, but if you want to shut it off, you need to actually <laughs> delete the instance. Yeah, if you want to be sure, just delete the whole project. Yes. So unless you disable the application, there's no other way to def do a default. Now, if you add other App Engine instances that have names, you can turn those off manually, and it's fine. Um, what's cool about if you disable the application is that all of your old versions, and this totally saved me today because uh, when I deployed a new one, and it takes 20 minutes uh, at a time, uh, I was able to roll back to an older version that was working, and I was able to direct traffic towards it. Um, and, that, and you can do that here. something I learned today. So you can, I took an older version and I can direct traffic and the way that works is I can go here and say split traffic. And this is cool if you want to do A-B testing, right? Where you've got, okay, let's try out the new version of the application for a while, but let's keep the old one going. But let's just send like 20% of the people, um, uh, you know, to this other version here. Let's see. And so we can basically adjust the traffic here. The, I don't have any of the other ones that are actually running, so I can't do that. I think I can do it this one. Um, but I could add a version also here. So what happened was it, the, it sends by default all the traffic to the, to the last one you published. Even if I say start this one up over down here, which we'll see this as serving, doesn't mean you're going to get any traffic to it you have to actually go in to the split traffic and switch it all, all over, or um, all your instances go to the broken one, right? But it's a good way to do an A-B test, to try out a new, th new thing and put it, kind of do a canary model for a deployment and see, was well, that one getting errors? Okay, let's direct all the traffic back to the old one. Something failed with our deploy and uh, this isn't good or some terrible bug has been found right away. So um, that's how you do that. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So um, you can associate a project to an account. So like, um, here, I'll show you. So I have my own personal one, and then I've got my employers here, and I can switch between these accounts. So if I go to my own, my trial's ended, and it tells you that. But it also says, now I can't access that project, right? That project belongs to uh, OCI. But I have my own little projects here, because I've done uh, Google Home stuff uh, in the past here, so I've got some applications for that, uh, projects set up for that. So that's one of them. Yes. Yeah, so they don't really have that project concept in Amazon. It's like um, you can have multiple accounts and, and consolidate the billing on them and separate them that way. Or if a, you have just one big account that's for the whole organization, you need to tag like every resource you can on Amazon because it will it'll get really disorganized and chaotic and you won't be able to figure out what's what, who, what belongs to who, right? And finance people really want you to tag things because they like to have a cost model broken out of, okay, these are so many dev things, or it might be for this client, these are so many production servers for this client, and when you tag things appropriately, then the, the billing breaks out with that. But in Google, it's all by, everything is by project. Even when you're using Google Home stuff, you have to have a project created for it. And it only lets you have, I, I have the limit like, you can only have five projects by default. You have to actually request an increase of projects um, by them to, get, to be able to have that, to have more than five, which I think is kind of low, but 
I guess they're just trying to prevent you from making a bunch of projects and forgetting that, that stuff's running and then getting some giant bill and calling and saying, yeah, I didn't know, you know, I don't really want to spend $10,000. <laughs> I think the G apps is stuff's not really part of Google Cloud, exactly. Yes, yes, they do, um, and that's that's pretty much separate from the cloud. There is whoever's the administrator of that account. So, uh, if um, OCI has access to an OAuth page, and then they can set what URLs are authorized and which applications are authorized for those URLs. Yes, yeah, you have to have someone with, someone has to give you the appropriate access if you're not the administrator. And that's not gonna be in the Google Cloud Console at all. There's actually a, um, a whole page for administering uh, GApp stuff. And, it's, and there's an OAuth tab in there and that's where you set all those things. Uh, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things you can do and they're adding stuff all the time. Um, I mean, these are just a, a few things uh, that uh, you can do with it, but um, look at all these other libraries, and this is probably, there's more now. So you can do speech APIs, you can do um, data flow stuff, we got uh, uh, Fire, you know, Firebase is a really popular database that Acloud Guru uses, even though they host most of their stuff on Amazon with Lambdas and things, they use the Firebase database because it's really cheap, and it's uh, easy to get a lot of data in and out of it. So they actually kind of have this hybrid serverless model where Google's serving up the database and then the, um, the rest of it's basically lambdas and S3 things. So I don't know if anyone's ever done a Cloud Guru course. Uh, no, it's a, it's a proprietary, it's a NoSQL database. So it doesn't, that's why it's cheap, right? It's just name value pair storage. I guess it's a lot cheaper than um, DynamoDB because DynamoDB charges you for row scans and things like that. Uh, but yeah, they got all of this stuff here. I mean, just a tremendous. They've integrated Stackdriver. It was a company they acquired, and all of the logging goes through Stackdriver, which is a really nice logging tool. I, I kind of miss it, because it used to work on multiple clouds. And now that they got bought by Google, they, it's basically only for Google now. So they've got, I think their logging is really nice. I, it's, it's more organized than um, Amazon stuff. So go out and do some fun stuff. Uh, I've got, here's some uh, URLs for all the uh, demos here. So you can grab the source and play around with it and get your free Google account, try it out, upload things. Um, don't, don't, uh, um, again, you don't have to give it a credit card to try it out, which is cool. So if your account hits the limit and you forget that stuff's running, then it's just gonna yell at you telling you you need to create a for real account with a credit card. So um, that makes it a little less scary, I think. All right, thank you.